Today we're going over the seven most savage commanders and their decks. I'm Mia, and I love winning games with door to nothingness. I'm busy, and I've been doored more times than I can count. And we're the Picking Nerds, and if you're looking to support someone on Patreon, might I suggest ourselves? Head over to the link in the description, pick the tier you want to join in, and then get some merch and exclusive videos in return. Another sponsor for this video is Cool Stuff Inc., the website where you can buy many Magic the Gathering products using the code NERDS for 5% off your entire order. That's code NERDS for 5% off. Tangible money that we're saving you. We're happy to help. We really, we really are. And we want to also help you sleeve the cards you buy with Dragon Shield, the best sleeves in the multiverse. Good sleeves. Head over to the description, EU or US link, pick the one that's better for you, and then get the sleeve straight from the source and your support channel at the same time. We're also sponsored by Moxfield.com, the best way to build a deck online. You know, there's going to be an ad somewhere in this video for Moxfield. You can guess where it is, and if you got it right, you're lying. You can guess where it is if you like being wrong. That's <laughs> what I always say. Also, happy birthday to everyone whose birthday's today, and also happy birthday to all of your pets. Yeah, we got to cover all our bases here. And this one is... The seven most savage commanders and their decks. We did extensive research on every commander that's ever existed, and we have millions of games of, as as data. So we're going to go over what savage means to us, which is basically if you don't answer this commander and you let their deck do their thing for a couple turns, like one or two turns, uh, you're just going to die. They're going to have an unstoppable game plan. So we're going to start off with savage commander number one, Slimefoot and Squee. It's a three mana three three that makes a sapling when it enters or attacks, and you can pay four mana and bring it back from the graveyard by sacrificing a sapperling, but you also get to bring back another creature with it at sorcery speed. And the thing that I think I didn't realize about this card at first is that that ability looks like a one-time deal. If you have a sack outlet, you just sacrifice Slimefoot and Squee, and now it's in the graveyard, and you just activate it again, and you just start spamming all the best creatures out of your graveyard. Yeah, we cut our butts beaten with this card because it just kept happening multiple times in a single turn, and they just like basically clogged the board. And that was a $20 version of this commander, so I don't even want to know what a, a non-budget version looks like, except I'm going to tell you right now, one of the cards that's probably in it is Mesmeric Orb. It says whenever anyone untaps anything, they mill a card. It's going to fill up graveyards. It's kind of maybe an alternate win condition, I guess, if your opponents keep milling themselves. But really, we're going to fill our graveyard, have 20 cards in there by turn 6, and then Slimefoot and Squeeze are going to have access to all the best cards to bring back. Another card for this deck is Butcher of Malakir. It basically says that anytime a creature you control dies, each opponent has to sack a creature. This is one of the cards that we actually lost to from this deck because the, they just kept s killing all their creatures and just we ha we couldn't keep a board state. Yeah, this is one of the only times I say Butcher is better than uh, you know like Grave Pact and Dictator of Erebos because the fact that it's a creature means that if you kill it, well, Slimefoot and Squee is just going to bring it right back if Slimefoot and Squee is dead in the graveyard. Or they replay it from the command zone, sack it, and then now it's dead, and I'll get back. Oh, butcher of Malakir. The sack outlets need to go. You need to take out the sack outlets from Slimefoot and Squee, or you're just done. Yeah, it's a, definitely an MVP in this deck. Something else that always overperforms in this deck, since you have sack outlets galore and you're kind of recycling Squee over and over, is Mahadi Emporium Master. It checks the number of creatures that died on your end step and makes that many treasures. So it kind of like supercharges your next turn where. This is what I'm talking about. Let, you let these de decks survive one or two turns. Well, the one turn is seven creatures died. Here's seven treasures. And the next turn is you're dead. This is one of the reasons why the person we were playing against was able to get so many Slimefoot and Squee triggers. It's, it was so powerful. Yeah, and another card that helped them go off was Golgari Germination, which turns your non-creature deaths into a nice little sapling, which is a requirement from Slimefoot and Squee. If you don't have a sapling for some reason, they can't do anything. So it's a nice little redundant way to keep saps on the board. Helps you survive board wipes. It just makes everything miserable because, like, if you're somebody with a board wipe in your hand, you have, like, Day of Judgment, and they have Squee and Golgari Germination. You wipe the board, Squee dies into a, into a sapperling, and then Squee's ready to come back. Basically a never-ending loop. You have to do something about this commander. Yeah, you get killed Golgari Germination or Squee or something. What, what, what are the, some of the best sack outlets? Uh, some of the best sack outlets are Ashnod's Altar and Altar of Dementia. Ashnod's Altar lets you get two mana for each creature that you sack, so you can keep paying that into the cost of Slimefoot and Squee. And Altar of Dementia says that every time you sack a creature, you mill equal to the creature's power. So you're going to fill up your graveyard with all the stuff that you want to bring back, and it's just value all over. And then when you fill up your graveyard with all the stuff you need, you can take your biggest creature, continuously reanimate it, and mill your opponents out to just KO them. I mean, Ashnod's Altar and maybe even Phyrexian Altar, they're just going to make it so that you're just constantly squeeing. I mean, if you have Phyrexian Altar and like you get wanted to throw like Avenger of Zendikar there, Slimefoot and Squee just makes infinite 
things. It's over. The game is over. Yeah, the, just the board states grow so big, and all you need is a few saplings. Yeah, uh, Namada Primeval Warden is another sapling outlet. It makes your opponent's creatures exile instead of dying, and it gives you a sapling for each one. So it's like kind of annoying. It's a little Kalidus effect, but it just is another way to make sure I'm always gonna have a sapling in play. And the last card for this deck is Sir Conrad the Grim. Every time one of your creatures dies or a creature is put into the graveyard from anywhere, each opponent takes one. How many saplings and recycled dudes do I have to do before the game is just over? Sir Conrad even has a mill ability on him to throw out some extra damage. Yeah, so plus the mill, plus the sa uh, sacrifice of the saplings, you basically just are flying damage left and right. Yeah, I mean, Sir Conrad works so well with literally like every other card on here, except Namada is a little bit of a nombo because the creature doesn't die, but then you get a sapling that does die, so it's kind of the same thing. So Typhoon and Squee, you need to keep them off. You need to exile their graveyard. I think that's probably the best way to combat this deck. Good Bajooka Bog, or what, a Tormon's Crypt, or... I mean, you're just going to need to pack Farewells and stuff, because you need to answer, like, everything they do. We love Farewell here, or at least I do. You do. We're going to hop over to our second Savage Commander. It's Selvala, Heart of the Wilds. It's one green green for two, three. Whenever the biggest creature power-wise enters, its controller draws a card. So they can apply to anyone, but it's really just going to apply to us. And we can pay green and tap it to add X mana in any combination of colors to our mana pool, where X is the biggest power of a creature we control. So this is a three-mana dork that always taps for essentially one mana because you can use, if it's the only creature you have, it's two power. So you pay green and then make two mana. So it really taps for one by itself. And if you control a creature that's huge, all of a sudden, you just get 15 mana on your turn, and then you start doing things like untapping her, playing bigger creatures, drawing more cards. It just fuels itself. This is a big green stompy deck anyways, and there are certain creatures you have to include. One of them is Galta Primal Hunger. It is It costs X less, where X is the amount the, uh, the total amount of power you have on your board. It's a 12-12, and you're going to start tapping for 12 mana right away. Yeah, so you play Galta for like 3 or 2, draw a card make 12 mana with Savala, and then sky's the limit from there. Honestly, like, I don't even think if you had the draw card, like, taken off, I think it would still be amazing because that's so much mana. The draw card is just like a little, you know, that's just the cherry on top. Yeah, it's literally a self-sustaining thing that just, you go, wow, they kind of just played magic for three turns, and now they have 25 mana and I'm gonna die. Primeval Protector is another one. It's basically a one mana 10-10 that puts a counter on your other creatures. So it powers up for maybe if you're trying to plan out an Alpha Strike, it's a one mana 10-10 if the game has progressed even a little bit. So Vala draws your card and the same thing, make a bunch of mana. Yeah, I just hit 10 straight to the face, you know, been hit with that before. Yeah, the actually the most brutal one is Phyrexian Dreadnought because it's a one mana 12-12. When it enters, there's a trigger to sacrifice it because you're not gonna have enough power on board to keep it around. So Vala doesn't care, you stack the triggers so you draw add 12 mana, and then it dies. It's basically like super mega dark ritual. I couldn't think for another place for this, but it is so good in this deck. Just free one mana, 12 mana, like yeah, amazing. Seems like a fair trade. Uh, <laughs> this is where things start getting tricky, though. If you let Silvala untap too many times, they're going to play Umbral Mantle, and it's a three mana equipment that equips for zero, and you can pay three to untap the creature. Well, Silvala taps herself to make mana, so if she makes more than four, I think, you just untap her for three, generate one or more, then just make infinite mana, and now you have infinite mana. And Umbral Mantle even lets you equip to all of your creatures to give them plus infinity, since you just have infinity mana. Absolutely. You're going to want to use Silvala as quickly as possible, so you want those haste enablers. One of them, Lightning Greaves, everyone loves protection on their commander, but also haste, you're going to just tap for mana immediately. We love that here. Yeah, Silvala tapping for mana immediately gets scary, and sometimes... Afterwards, then Galta attacks you because we're still in the pre-combat when you tap Savala, so then you move it over and you just take 12. It's not a nice little bonus. And you're going to see a lot of Rishkar's expertise in this deck. This is going to draw equal to your greatest power. This is where the deck just turns into every single card in this deck can just be big creatures and card draw. So you cast Rishkar's expertise, draw like 11. Then you cast another spell for free. Now you're generating mana with Silvala. Maybe you found a way to untap her. There's a million different ways to do it. And you're just going to chain Life's Legacy and Momentous Fall and maybe Greater Good. The game is just over. There's no way to come back. You're taking an infinite turn. And you can also draw even more cards with Garuk's Uprising. It says that anytime a creature power four or greater comes into the battlefield under your control, you draw a card. And that's what your entire deck is built around anyways. Yeah, so your whole, now your creatures are drawing like two cards when they enter. It's just getting out of control. All the card draw combos and giant creatures means there's, you have to take Silvala out and shoot. Silvala cannot remain on the field for like any amount of time. All right, nobody's going to disagree with me on this next one. It belongs on the list of Savage Commanders. It's Kozilek, the Great Distortion. It's eight and two wingdings for a 12-12 with Menace. When you cast them, you draw back up to seven cards, and then 
you can discard a card to counter a spell with the same mana value. You'd think that the 10 mana cost for this commander would be a problem, but it never is with Colorless because there's so many ways to ramp him out. Like Eldrazi Temple, getting two mana for him, oh my god, that just speeds it up so much. There's just an extra Ancient Tomb in the deck, and Eye of Ugin is another Ancient Tomb that actually has a really nasty trick. It makes Kozla cost two less, so you're casting him ahead of schedule, but then when you get up to enough mana, you could search for an Eldrazi of the mana value of the card that's on the stack that you want to counter. Another way to ramp out Kozilek is Jeweled Lotus. Three mana for basically free? Yeah, that's it's, amazing. You always see these spikier cards in Kozilek, but it's because everybody knows that this card is just not reasonable at all, and it will just beat you into the dirt. So you might as well just turbo him out on turn three and get the rule zero conversation like, yeah, I'm going to destroy you. Yeah, I'm never playing this deck and being like, oh yeah, you know, this is a, this is a five, actually. Yeah, my deck's a four. I don't, <laughs> I'm just trying to cast Kozilek on turn four. You also get Basalt Monolith, which is like one of the fairer... Uh, mana rocks if you're not going infinite with it, and this deck doesn't have to because you can just kind of pay three and like charge up to use three mana later and cast Kozilek. Well, by itself, it already gives you turn seven Kozilek. Plus, Geo Golem is in this deck, which is one of the only places that I've actually seen this card played. It says when this deals combat damage, you can actually just play your commander for free from the command zone. Yep, so you just cheat now, Kozilek. If you just play Geo Golem on turn five, if we're getting real slow, well, that's Kozilek on turn six, and now you're dominating the game. Kozilek sort of warps the entire game around him, which is very flavorful because that's kind of what he does in magic, but two hits, you're dead, and then you can't resolve any spells that would kill him because I'm just going to counter them. Like with Trading Post, if I have an artifact in my graveyard, I'm, well, let's assume I have varying mana values of artifacts in my graveyard. I'll sack a creature to get them back when you try to cast a spell that's relevant. So if I have a 3-drop, 4-drop, 5-drop, and 6-drop, I'll just hold up Trading Post, wait till you cast your 4-drop board wipe, and then go, nope, I'm going to get back my 4-drop artifact, and then discard it to counter your spell. And to protect Kozlik, we have Commander's Plate. Sure, the stats are nice, but having protection from every color that's not in your commander's identity, which is all of them in this case, that's just amazing. Yeah, and uh, the stats kind of don't change the math. Kozlik's still going to kill you in two hits, except now I guess you can do it even without commander damage, basically, but you can't block it. There's just nothing to do. You, now, now none of your spot removal works, so you only have a, a, a very narrow band of cards like board wipes and sacrifice and anything you play we're going to counter with Kozla because there's nothing threatening that I have to use my cards on so I'm going to be full of cards. I actually just traded a commander's plate to my friend for a Kozla deck back like last year and boy did I regret the first game that I played with it. <laughs> just always protected. Yeah couldn't do anything after a certain point. Mm -hmm. Let's go to another more spell slingy uh, commander. This is Prosper Tonebound. He's four mana, one four with death touch. At your end step, you exile a card to impulse draw for the next turn. And whenever you cast a spell or play a land from exile, you get a treasure token, which is a lot. I think Prosper's kind of a sleeper because we play him in the cube sometimes and people don't pick him very highly, but he's so powerful. You don't have to do anything. Prosper, literally, you could just put Prosper, swap him out for a commander or another red black deck and he'll just be amazing still. <laughs> He asks, like, nothing of you, and I think people sleep on him a little bit because he was actually a pre-con commander. I think so. But he's super powerful, and just with all of the impulse draw in red, it, he just gets so much value it, over it. It just starts chaining impulse draw into impulse draw. All you gotta do is put a bunch of card draw on your deck, and Prosper's gonna basically make all your spells cost one less by refunding you after you play them. Like, Ignite the Future is gonna be our stand-in for all the impulse draw. You impulse draw three times. That's three treasures you have stored up till the next turn. Then you can flash it back to cast three spells for free, which then gives you three treasures. Also, with Professional Facebreaker, you can use those treasures. When you hit, you make treasures, and then you can sack a treasure to exile the top card of your library and play it, which gets you another treasure when you play it. Yeah, so, like, theoretically, if every card in your deck was one mana, and you just you could just flip your entire deck, you just keep going. It fuels itself. You play, use a treasure to play the card. Playing the card gets you a treasure. Well, how about that? Mm -hmm. I also think Zorn is going to be, like... It's one of the marquee cards of the deck. It just says whenever you would make one treasure, you make two. So now we're we're actually just in Stormville now. We're the mayor of Stormville. <laughs> you have so many treasures for that. But when you sack treasures, do you get a payoff? Well, of course you can. With Mayhem Devil, whenever you sacrifice a permanent, you deal one damage to any target, whether that be a creature you don't want on the field or somebody's face just to BM them. Like, that's just going to go so well with this deck. Yeah, the thing I love about Mayhem Devil is it doesn't cost any mana to keep going. You just have an engine built in. Treasures sacrifice themselves. built in. So as you're going to storm off and just spew out your entire deck, you're just killing people like residually. A card that actually was talking about being banned from the Commander RC was Mirkwood Bats, which works great in this deck. It says anytime you create or sacrifice a token, you uh, each opponent loses one life. I've seen so much tech around this card to begin with, but in Prosper, it's amazing. Whenever you cast a spell, 
each opponent loses two life is basically what this says. That's build your own gutter snipe? We're already creating treasures, and we have to sack them anyways just to play more of our spells. So two free damage per opponent. I think we saw our friend Veggie deal 56 with this one card over one game. Yeah, it was pretty nuts. Uh, Delayed Last Fireball. This is a card that is, like, built for Prosper, basically, despite not coming out in the Precon. It deals two damage to all your opponents and their creatures, but if you cast it from Exile, it deals five, which is now, that's like, okay, wait a minute, that's too much damage. This is, like, the go-to one-sided board wipe. And it's usually a sign that the game's almost over. If you haven't answered Prosper and they've built up to Delayed Blast Fireball, you're probably dead. I love Delayed Blast Fireball because it's one of the only red foretell cards that you play and you're like, ooh, wonder what this could be. And you can call it from a mile away. You're like, oh, that's Delayed Blast Fireball. My stuff's going to be gone soon. Yeah, it still doesn't even matter. You're like, crap, what am I supposed to do about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've definitely got got with this card multiple times. Yeah, and another way to close out games as you're storming off, as it were, is Passion Archaeologist. It gives Prosper the ability to deal damage to opponents based on the mana value of spells you cast from Exile. So now, like, you're cracking up, you're stacking up Mayhem Devils and Mirkwood Bats, which require no mana, and now Passion Archaeologist also requires no mana, so all you have to do is just chain together your nonsense impulse draws, and opponents are just going to die. We've talked about this prior with uh, BZ's Cascade deck. However, it just says from Exile, so it works here, it works in Cascade, it can work with Impulse Draw. It's just a great card overall. Yeah, it's pretty solid. And I think the, ne the next card you need for Prosper is, is Moxfield.com. This is a card that doesn't cost any money to add into your website deck, and it'll make your deck building skills probably 10 times better. The best deck building site that you can use. Don't use Redacted Deck Site. Oh, what are you using Redacted Deck Site for? Stinky. Absolutely stinky. Go to moxfield.com, and if you want, give us a follow. Yeah, we would love that. And you can follow all your favorite deck brewers on there as well. Next on the Savagery is Maelstrom Wanderer. It is 8 mana for a 7-5. It's got haste, and all your creatures actually have haste. And it has Cascade twice. So you flip until you hit a spell that costs less, cast it for free, then do it again. I actually saw this on Twitter, but it's the... The flavor text on House from Wonder says, like, Cascade, and it says, then do it again. Yeah, like, it's like the rules text, is then do it again. <laughs> That's amazing. One of the cards we want in here immediately is Birds of Paradise. We want that mana immediately. Plus, if you have House from Wonder out anyways, you can use it, um, like, right for Haze. Yeah, you want to just stack this deck full of all the ramp. Every one and two and three mana, four mana ramp spell just goes in, and then everything else in your deck is just gigantic six, seven drops that just are going to kill people in, like, one or two hits. So Burst is representative of, like, you need to get on board early, and you need a ramp to play Maelstrom Wander on turn four, and if you do, there's a good chance you're just going to win. <laughs> the same is true of Sky Shroud Claim. This is, like, your four mana, very special type of four mana ramp because it's going to put two lands untapped, so you can go turn three Sky Shroud Claim, go get Breeding Pool Forest, tap them out for another ramp spell or another mana dork, and then you're just off to the races. There's... Usually, you what you go, how did I get so brutalized this game? And then the answer is, they cast Sky Shroud Claim. Master of Wonder is one of those cards where it's really hard to build it at a lower power. Yeah, it's just as long as you put sixes and seven, if you have 13 seven drops in your deck, in a Master Wanderer deck, I don't, you're just going to keep spamming them later in the game. You know what also benefits from six drops or above? Emoti, Celebrant of Bounty. It says everything with six mana value or above has Cascade. So we're just going to be chaining these Cascades left and right with all of the big creatures we're going to drop. Yeah, so like Emoti has Cascade. Then you're going to cast Maelstrom Wander, which now has three instances of Cascade. And any of those that hit seven or six drops also have Cascade. How many things do I need to play in one turn with haste before someone or everyone is dead? We love our free stuff here. Yeah, Atali, Primal Conqueror, this is your classic, like, good stuff, like... Just generically powerful, no synergy, seven drops that go in the deck. It's a five for one. Every creature you play with, it's going to have haste because of Maelstrom Wander, and it's just going to lead to death really, really quick. I know some people were complaining about Atali having a gruel color identity because they were like, oh, it can't go in the decks that the old Atali goes in. Can't but, go prosper. But in this deck, oh my god, it was like, it was like made for it. Another thing you can cheat out in this deck is Holebreaker Horror. When you cast spells, you can either bounce spells back to people's hands or bounce non-land permanents back to their hands. You can basically ice down the entire board with your free cascade triggers or just little one-drops here and there. Yeah, if you cast it before Maelstrom Wander, he'll give you at least three bounces. And if you cast it during, you're cheating out a seven-drop for free. I mean, that seems pretty good to me. Also, no Old Knobbone is another, like, oh my god, what is happening card because you're going to cheat it out with Maelstrom Wander, let's say. That's kind of the best case scenario with all these cards. Or just play it afterwards and it still has haste. Jam with everything, connect for like 30 damage, kill someone, get 30 treasures, and now you just have like 
who knows what you can do. And with Hallbreaker Horror, you're going to start taking a lot of extra game actions at that point. <laughs> at that point, it doesn't matter how many Cascade Triggers you have, because you'll have the mana to play everything you want, too. Yeah, bonus uh, bonus Hallbreaker Horror synergy is you can just bounce Maelstrom Wander if it's going to die, and then get two more Cascades on deck. And then one of the most savage cards, since we're talking about savagery, that you can flip off a of Maelstrom Wander or play afterwards or connect with, it's Fiery Emancipation. It says your sources deal triple damage. And Maelstrom Wander conveniently has haste and seven power. So if, if there's a board wipe and you're one of the first people to recover or you're not the last person to recover and there's anybody defenseless, you can play Maelstrom Wander, cascade into Fiery Emancipation, hit somebody for 21 commander and they're just dead. Yeah, with especially with all the creatures having haste too, if you chain it back with things like Atali and you get a bunch of creatures from that, you're just going to be able to swing for what, maybe lethal, definitely lethal. We'll have to see, but like I think that's just brutal. Most of the time with all these commanders, you kind of just have to kill the player. The best move with these savage commanders is to just eliminate the player from the game. Don't let them do this, because if you let them cascade off of Maelstrom Wander, it's too late. I'm sorry, but the thing you were supposed to do, like if you wanted to like take them out, is just punch them while they're casting Sky Shroud Clay, not after they cast Hallbreaker Horror and <laughs> Fiery Emancipation. Creature removal is sometimes the answer, but with these savage commanders, player removal is always the answer. Yep, yeah, this one is definitely a player removal over creature removal. This is Yuriko, the Tiger's Shadow. She's got Commander Ninjutsu, which is dumb because it doesn't use tax at all, so she's always getting cheated out for two if you return an unblocked attacker. And whenever a ninja hits a player, you flip the top card of your deck and put it in your hand, and each opponent loses life equal to its mana value. So this is stack full of high mana value cards and little dummies to connect. You're going to get those early drops so quickly, like Ornithopter, so you're going to be able to attack and then ninjutsu in something real quick. And that's just the turn two Yuriko. You're going to get one trigger turn two, and then anything after that, that's just... Oh my god, you're just going to be getting hit like left and right. Yeah, Ornithopter is one of the best little dummies because it's always playable. You can never not cast it. So you cast it on turn one, let's say. Then turn two, you attack with it, guaranteed Yuriko. Then you bounce the, the Ornithopter, but then you can just replay it. So now you're free to ninjutsu more things later for like no mana. Ornithopter is really annoying. Thousand Face Shadow is another one. It's just a janky 1 1 flyer. Has ninjutsu. It's a ninja though, so Yuriko also triggers off of it. It's just like all this stuff stacks up and pretty much. Against Yuriko decks, if there's not a well-timed sword to plowshares or something, turn four, you're like, okay, how do we beat this deck? How do, yeah. we, how do we do this, guys? You can try and build this as a ninja deck, but no matter how many ninjas you put in, it's going to get so many triggers off of it, and it's just going to be so strong. Like with this next one, Fallen Shinobi, when you deal combat damage with it, you, you can exile the top two of the player's library, and you can play both of them for free. I actually hit with this card uh, turn four, in a game recently and I just got what like a five drop and a six drop right off of the player's library and that just shifted the game in my favor immediately. It's like oh cool I cast 11 mana value of free stuff now I get more threats and Fallout Shinobi still in play and I had blue black so I'm gonna be able to make it unblockable and stuff this is never gonna go away. Another card that I feel like if you see it pre-combat you're actually dead and sorry like the game's over it's Insidious Dreams Four mana sorcery, additional cost to cast it, you discard X cards, but you go search your library for any for that many cards, put them on top in any order, and then you connect with Yurko or two other ninjas, let's say, you know, Changeling Outcast, uh, Thousand Face Shadow, and you just flip three eleven drops off the top of your deck. Yeah, we take 33. Yeah, we're going to stack the top of our deck too with Brainstorm. We're just going to have so many of these types of effects, like with top and stuff. So you're going to be able to flip whatever you want. Oh, you have a 11 drop in your hand? Well, you will just put that right back and we'll immediately just hit everyone for 11. Yeah, it's not going to be a mystery. It's not a mystery with Yurko. You know what's on top of their deck. They're topping, they're brainstorming, they're insidious dreamsing. And you're going to hit something like Temporal T Trespass, which is another like avenue of the deck where if you don't stop it by like turn five, you actually might just be dead because they're going to start chaining time walks. Temporal Trespass is 11 mana, so boom, take 11. Then it takes an extra turn. So Yuriko and all the other dummies on tap, and they can just bully whoever doesn't have blockers and then flip three more 10 drops off the top and just kill everybody. You're not going to get too many turns when you start seeing Temporal Trespass. I've never seen a Yuriko deck without extra turn spells in it mm -hmm. because it just gets so brutal. It's like, oh, you only have two creatures? Well, in a few turns, you won't have any. Yeah, it's like Cosmic decks never don't have Jewel Lotus and, stuff and like Mana Crypt, and then for some reason, and then Yuriko decks just always have time walks. Like, oh... Okay, now we're playing the time log. All right, all right. Uh, Discovery Dispersal is another one that's like, I like this one because it's a cheap little cantrip, but also it costs seven mana when you flip it from the top because it checks both sides and adds them up. So it's just a little like, it's a castable card, so it's not dead. You don't, you're not just using it to burn everybody out. 
It has two modes, which I'm surprised you're not calling this an MTFC at this point. It's basically an MTFC. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but yeah, this, the total on both, plus the versatility of it, it has to go in a Yuriko deck. And you're going to be sorry when they flip it off the top. We're going to move on to a commander that definitely has some similarities. It's very snowball-y like Yuriko is. It's Najila the Blade Blossom. It's a 3 mana 3-2. Whenever a warrior attacks, you can have the controller of the warrior make another warrior. So she stacks warriors and they kind of double up each time. And then you can pay Wooper to untap the creatures that attack this turn to give you an extra combat. Even though this is a five color deck, this isn't a five color good stuff deck. We have a plan that we want to enact. We want as many combat steps as possible and we want to just keep hitting until our opponents die. Yeah, you kind of just have to keep making Wooburg. So if you can continuously make Wooburg, there's no limit to how much you can activate Najila. So if you let Najila start off her thing, even a fair, you know, non-CDH Najila deck, if you let them start up, you probably are gonna get screwed. It's too late. Like Druid's repository, probably in like 90% of Najila decks. Whenever a creature attacks, it gets a counter, and then it can remove counters to make mana. So if you attack with five creatures and they connect, you now have five mana. Well, great. Untap all the creatures that attacked, extra combat. Attack again, they all doubled. Now, so now you have probably ten counters, and it's just too much to to handle. The fact that Najila doesn't even risk herself in combat, you can just send dummy, like little tiny warriors at people, makes it real tough to, to combat unless you kill it continuously. Another great way to make mana is Grim Hireling. Whenever a creature deals combat damage to a player, you can make two treasures. And that's just three creatures. You can make Wooburry instantly. Oh, another combat phase? So you just deal damage with three creatures? That's so easy in this deck where you're just spitting out creatures left and right. Yeah, Najila just spits out creatures. Just fill your deck full of warriors. It's not It's not too hard. You're playing a warrior deck. Uh, Ma Marnius Kelgar is really weird. And I had to look. I was like, does this? How good is this with this commander? It turns out, Najila says, whenever a warrior attacks, so if you attack with five warriors, there will be five triggers of Najila on the stack. Marnius says, whenever you create a token, one or more tokens, draw a card. Those warriors are not created at the same time. They are go, trigger resolves, one warrior. Trigger resolves, one warrior. Marnius is like, oh, cool, draw a card. Draw a card, draw a card every single time. Marnius gets you so much advantage. You it's might deck yourself, like you could deck yourself with this guy if you're not, you know, paying attention. Infinite combat steps? Oh, I'll just, uh, infinite card, I'm dead. <laughs> well, don't do that. But yeah, Marnius is like a dirty little stinker. A card that actually is a warrior also is Devilish Valet. Every time a creature enters, you double its power. It has trample, and since it counts itself as a warrior, it'll trigger Najila. So, if you're doing infinite combat steps, this will just be infinity damage. Well, you definitely don't need infinite. Let's say you attack with six warriors, and Devilish Valet is one of them. Two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four. You're dead. Like, okay, I just attacked with six creatures. That's all I did. Yeah, I've seen this go infinite in, like, arena and that sort of thing when people were sharing their screenshots of the damage they were putting out with this. Yeah, they but, break the game. <laughs> but you can break the game just as easily with just Najila and him out. Just break your opponents. We don't have to break the game. Uh, Secure the Waste is another favorite. This is a good way to let you, like, kind of build up a board at instant speed without anybody knowing what's going on. You just pass with or without Najila. You just pass a turn. End step makes seven warriors. Untap. If you have Najila, great. If you don't, play her. Then use one of your mana production cards like Derevi or Druid's Repository to then generate mana and just goes, oops, I'm attacking with 14 warriors now. What are you going to do? An enchantment that works so well with this deck is Reconnaissance. It says everything has vigilance, basically. So in the early game, when you can't get those infinite combat steps immediately, you can just go, oh, attacking. Oh, they're also chump blockers. It's for free. Yeah, it's it's a weird wording on the card in case you didn't know. It says untap an attacking creature and remove it from combat. If they're blocked and they're going to die and you don't like the outcome, remove them from combat and untap them. If they connect, you can use the post-combat damage step that's still in combat to untap them after they deal damage, so they really just have vigilance. This card is actually pretty interesting because I thought it was a lot more than it was. I think I just bought it for like 10 bucks too. It's not unreasonable. It's a really, it's a pretty sweet card if you're in, in combat metas. Uh, Vanquisher's Banner, we just talked about warriors, so you're going to stack your deck full of all of the reasonable warriors. You don't have to go too hard on putting 60 warriors in your deck because Najila is just kind of crazy. But Vanquisher's Banner is going to be good to help you refuel. This deck definitely wants card draw, so you're going to have that. If you want to look at seven more commanders, you can look at the seven most fun commanders right here. That sounds way less savage. <laughs> you should do that. <laughs> oh, and remember, Discovery Dispersal is actually not an MDFC. 